Hey everybody, welcome to this week's video. And today we're gonna to talk food. Everybody loves food. In fact, for Shabbat dinner tonight, we're serving Thai food, kosher Thai food, just to make a little spin on things, keep it interesting for the students. And quite frankly, I enjoy a little change up of our regular Shabbat dinner fare. So we're looking forward to that. And Pesach is coming. So lots of stuff going on and a great speaker this week. Um, Deborah Benaderet, who is from the kibbutz of Zikim, that miraculously was not hurt on October 7th, even though it's very close to the Gaza border. Uh, we had uh, Gil Troy, Jerusalem Post columnist, speak to our students, uh, professor at McGill University, author. It was, it was really a, a good week for Jewish students on campus. Um, but let's get back to the food business. It's a fascinating piece in the Talmud from a woman named Yalta. Yalta was married to a great sage named Rav Nachman. Um, Rav Nachman was a leader in the Babylonian Jewish community in around the third century. Um, Yalta, our sages tell us, was a Isha Chashuva, a very prominent woman, an important woman, a scholar in her own right. And one day she said to her husband the following. She said, you know, everything that's prohibited in the Torah has a permitted counterpart so you could have a similar experience. And she gave some examples. For example, the Torah prohibits the fats of certain animals, domesticated animals, fat of a cow, a sheep, a goat. But the Torah permits us to eat the fat of, let's say, undomesticated animals like a bison, or giraffe, or deer. Okay, another example. The Torah forbids us to eat the meat that contains blood. But the liver is permitted. And even though you have to kosher the liver, it still has the taste from the very bloody organ that it is. And then he gives us another example. Torah, she says to her husband, you know, the Torah prohibits us from eating pork. But the Torah permits the brain of a shibuta. It's a certain type of fish. Fish, you can eat any component of the fish, even the blood of the fish. The Torah prohibits us from eating a giruta. I don't know what type of fish it is, but it's a certain type of non-kosher fish. Giruta in Aramaic. But you're allowed to eat the tongue of an ordinary fish, apparently, which has a similar taste. Okay, and she gives some other examples of uh, relationships and so on. <clears throat> and then she said to her husband, you know, I would love to eat a meat dish cooked in milk. What can I have that provides me that experience? So her husband said... Tell the chefs to cook, to roast the udders of a cow. And there's a whole process for koshering the udder. But since the udder contains the milk, it would retain some of that flavor, even if you got rid of all the milk. And it is permitted, but do not do it at home. You have to learn how to kosher the udder, just like you would have to learn to kosher the liver and other parts of the animal. Very interesting. Which, by the way, sheds light on the permissibility of things like vegan um, pork, vegan ham, or bacon bits, which are fake, but contain, but, but, uh, but, uh, but apparently, I've never eaten bacon, but apparently it tastes like bacon. Or you go to some restaurants, some kosher restaurants, and they make some sort of a, a pastrami or something that supposedly tastes like bacon. I have no idea, but I mean, it's perfectly permitted. Taste it, eat it, enjoy it. And the question is why? Why is this permitted? And I'm bringing this up this week because this week's Torah portion is where we learn that you're forbidden to eat pork and all the other forbidden animals. It's in this week's Parsha. There's your Parsha connection. So on our Tuesday learning, we discussed this. And there's a beautiful teaching from the Shalah that I want to teach you, Rabbi Yeshaya Halevi Horowitz, 17th century scholar, this is absolutely a beautiful teaching that he says in the name of his illustrious father, who was also a scholar in his own right. He, he asks the question, says, why would the Talmud 
give us this whole story of Yalta. Oh, she likes this, she likes that. I mean, you know, it's like, it seems silly. So he says, it touches on an interesting question. So you know, let's say, let's take the archetype of the, the, you know, the typical non-kosher food, let's say pork. Should I desire pork, but not eat it? Because God said so in the Torah. Or should I say, ah, it's disgusting, I don't want to touch it. I don't even want to ah, look at it. Just make myself disgusted by it so that I won't even desire it. The Torah forbids it. I don't even have a desire for it. So the Medrash tells us, <clears> the <throat> Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, the first century scholar says, that better to desire it and want it and say, uh-uh, I'm not having it. God told me not to. I would love to have it. I would absolutely love to indulge in a good ham sandwich. But my Father in Heaven decreed upon me that I should not have it. This is the Midrash. So the Shalos father says, wait a second. If you've never tasted it, how are you going to want it? You cannot want what you've never had, what you've never tasted, what you've never appreciated. So he says, aha. God made the world that there are certain things that have a similar flavor. As Yalta observed, all these things that taste like the original prohibited item so that I could develop a desire for it and then resist because Hashem told me. Now, I want to just share, share a caveat that the Rebbe brings on this. And he says, maybe not everyone should engage in this kind of um, process. We don't want to put ourselves in a compromising situation person will say, you know, I'm not supposed to gamble. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the casino just so I can avoid gambling. Maybe that's not too wise. I'm not supposed to eat non-kosher food. So, you know, I'm going to go to the non-kosher restaurant, sit over there, and then walk out. Okay, so that, that may not be so smart. But to develop a taste using a permitted, a perfectly permitted thing, so that I can have an appreciation for what I'm resisting is, is something valuable. And um, this really cuts to the whole idea of should I desire things? How do I control myself, self-control? Should I be disgusted or should I really want it? But then use my self-control muscle, which is probably the most valuable in our lives. Anyway, there's more to think about this. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. But there's a little take on this story with Yalta, fascinating woman. One day I'll tell you some other stories of Yalta. But until then, I wish you a Shabbat Shalom.